good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm introducing Benuchings. We will talk about uh, what's new in the Linux kernel since what's in Squeeze. And Wizzy, even? Yeah, since, yeah, what's in Wizzy. And what's missing in Debian. So. I'll start with the obligatory biography. Maybe not obligatory. Um, uh, I spent my day working as a professional software engineer. I've been doing that for 15 years. And uh, I've been a Debian contributor for the past 10 years. And uh, for about five years now, uh, I've been working on the Linux kernel in both of those roles. In my day job, I'm maintaining a net driver for a, a hardware company, SolarFlare, which is a sponsor of the conference. Uh, and I'm work, working on more uh, core kernel code as necessary. Uh, I'm a member, a member of the Debian kernel team, and currently I'm doing most of the work on uh, the, the packages in Unstable, aside from uh, supporting uh, specific architecture, specific ports. Uh, I'm also maintaining the stable update branch for Linux 3.2, as used in Wheezy. Uh, that's maintained on kernel.org and goes through review uh, upstream. So, the Linux kernel is released early and often. Uh, it's released about five times a year before you, uh, and that's the uh, major uh, stable releases. And there are updates with bug fixes every week or two. Um, some of the features that turn, turn up in these releases aren't quite ready, uh, either because they haven't been fully debugged, or there are some bits still to fill in, or uh, you need new user land, and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about uh, today. Wheezy, as you probably know, has the Linux 3.2, which is now uh, pretty old, the current version being Linux 3.10. So the good news is we now have uh, lots of new features in testing and unstable uh, relative to Wheezy. And the bad news is some of them aren't really usable yet. So I'm going to go through uh, a number of those features and talk about what's missing, what uh, people might be able to do to, to fix that. The team device driver uh, is an alternative to bonding. Bonding is uh, a way of combining two network, two or more network links uh, to achieve either greater bandwidth, you use them all at once, or greater reliability. Uh, you use one of them, but if that goes down because uh, the switch breaks or something else fails, uh, then you can fall over to, fail over to the other link. Uh, the bonding driver has an awful lot of code, has a lot of awful code in the kernel uh, that uh, manages this pretty much autonomously. The team driver is a re-implementation of that. That leaves a lot of the high-level control in, in user land, uh, which we don't have at the moment. We have the, the uh, you, you can set up one of these devices with the IP command from IP root 2. Um, but to really get it working, you need some new tools, which are part of the Live Team project. Uh, so there is an open bug to, to get this working. Someone has, in fact, started packaging that. Uh, if you want to make this work, that's the bug to uh, to look at. Uh, so there's a new major feature called transcendent memory, not to be confused with transactional memory. Uh, it's it's a kind of abstract storage for memory. So there are bits of this in what started uh, were initially added in Linux 3.0, but then uh, more and more pieces have been added, uh, and some of them are not in Wheezy. So this is a, a kind of uh, extra layer of storage between the uh, page cache, which is 
all the all the files and data that are held in memory uh, and uh, your disk. Uh, it's expected to be it's expected that it'll be faster than writing or reading writing to or reading back from disk, uh, but not quite as fast as simply direct access to memory. Um, so where does this where is this storage really? Where are these pages really going if they uh, go into transcendent memory? Uh, if you're running a machine under Zen, they could be stored by the hypervisor in some pool uh, that's kind of that's shared between all, all the virtual machines. Uh, it could actually still be in local memory, uh, but compressed. Uh, memory tends to compress actually quite well, you might remember. Back in the 90s, there were these memory doublers for Windows, and this is, the, I believe, a similar sort of idea uh, for Linux. Uh, and you can also uh, have a, a cluster of machines sh uh, share their spare, uh, spare memory space with each other. That's called Ramster. Uh, and that's not really done yet. It's still un under development. None of these things are enabled in Debian kernels. Some of them probably could be, but it needs someone to really think about the configuration, what's, what should be enabled by but default, what uh, needs to be left to a local configuration. Um, are there any scripts that need, are needed to set this up? So uh, I've got a link there to uh, an article uh, in uh, Linux Weekly News about, uh, which gives me more details about this. If you want to make it work, have a look at that. Uh, send us a proposal to the kernel team. Uh, right. So we have new graphics drivers. Uh, of course, the uh, the um, most of you are probably using one of the i915 Radeon and Nuvo drivers, and those have uh, gained support for new chips from the, the three vendors since Wheezy. Uh, but there are also completely new drivers for several new, well, several old and new and virtual uh, hardware devices. Uh, and, well, kernel drivers for graphics are good uh, for several reasons. Partly they're more robust than the next, and you don't have this uh, Fragile handoff between uh, using text mode and using X graphics, and uh, if the X server crashes, then your graphics are not dead. On the other hand, if your kernel, if your graphics driver crashes, then the kernel has crashed and your machine is completely dead. So <laughs> it's not all good. Um, at least at that point, you do get uh, a nice trace back on the screen, probably because the uh, the uh, the kernel driver can switch back to text mode and and, uh, and do that. Uh, another, I think, important motivation for this is that user mode uh, drivers aren't really compatible with doing secure boot. Uh, you can't user land should not be trusted to access uh, hardware devices directly. It has to go through the kernel. So hence the uh, uh, replacement of the X drivers for, uh, for various uh, graphics hardware with kernel drivers. Unfortunately, the X drivers we have in Debian don't work with this at the moment. Uh, so if you want to make it work, uh, go and join the X strike force, uh, package the new drivers, or in some cases just new versions of the driver. Uh, module signing is something that has been seen in uh, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux for a while now, and it's for them. I believe it's just it's just been a way to uh, check whether people are using unsupported uh, uh, third-party modules and uh, then tell them they can't have support anymore. Uh, but now, uh, with uh, the the plan to support secure boot. That becomes more important uh, as, as a means of uh, as a security feature. 
So the in mainline Linux, you can you can get you can generate a key at build time, sign all the modules that are built alongside the kernel, and then either at build time or at run time, at boot time that is, you can tell the kernel not to load unsigned modules. Uh, uh, there's a major flaw in this, which is that uh, this doesn't leave any room for out of tree modules. How do you uh, get the key? The uh, how do you tell the kernel that those should be trusted? And that's there's a certain amount of controversy about how exactly you do that. Uh, um, and yeah, there's, there's if you actually want to make secure boot work. We don't just need module sign, we also need a kernel image signed. We need assigned bootloaders. Uh, and we probably need to disable some features like uh, access to dev mem, which is how the, the X, uh, X, graphics, X graphics drivers access the hardware, which can't be allowed because that would, that would uh, undermine secure boot. Uh, so uh, there's a meeting on Tuesday uh, where hopefully we can discuss uh, how or whether Debian can make uh, Debian can make its releases bootable uh, with Secure Boot. So the discard feature. Uh, some. Well, m probably many uh, solid-state disks and other flash, flash devices uh, support uh, this discard operation. The, the way that flash is managed means uh, you can't simply do random writes, uh, and you need the you need a lot m need somewhat more capacity on the physical flash than the um, operating system and the file system C as being there. And the device can work uh, more efficiently the more uh, spare capacity it has. So if the file system tells it that free parts of the disk are free by issuing a discard operation, uh, then it becomes more efficient. It can. Uh, uh, it can be faster, and its 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 lifetime, its working lifetime, will probably be longer. Uh, it's also possible to have uh, thin provisioned uh, storage servers, where which pretend to have more capacity than they really do, uh, and that's this more or less works because um, when you uh, set up a, a set up a server with so much disk space on the sound, you're probably not going to use it all. And on average, if you know that on average, your servers are going to use 60% of their, of their disk, you can maybe allocate in the, uh, initially 70% of the, of the disk space you pretend that you're giving them. But that only works, uh, again, if the, uh, if the file system tells the storage server that it's about the free space on the disk. So in order for this to work, of course, the hardware needs to support it, the driver needs to support it, the file system needs to support it, and any layers of, of storage in between them, like LVM and RAID, need to, need to make discard work. Um, and so I'm mentioning this here because uh, Linux 3.7 finally added support for this in the RAID, MD RAID layer. It does need to be explicitly enabled as a file system option and as an option in those uh, storage layers. And the Debian installer isn't doing this by default. There are reasons why you might not want to want to do it by default. But at the moment, there isn't even an option to do that. So there's an open bug for this. If you want to get discard working uh, by default, or at least make it easier for people uh, to, to, to set up, uh, go and look at that bug see what there is to do. So uh, another interesting feature which is being uh, incrementally implemented 
is containers. In fact, we had containers before. A kind of a, a lightweight virtual machine. Uh, a, if you use uh, KVM or Zen, then the each virtual machine has its own kernel, uh, its own dedicated memory. Well, that, that can be sort of varied using a balloon driver, but there's an awful lot more dedicated resources. Um, whereas a container uses the same kernel for both the host and the virtual machine, but everything in the virtual machine has it has limited privileges and limited uh, limited use of the of the physical machine's resources. And this has been done before, in, and we had this in Debian with the OpenVZ and Linux V server patches. Uh, the trouble is that these are quite intrusive to the kernel. They have to change uh, memory management, file system, networking, the scheduler, uh, all of which are, are uh, changing fairly quickly in mainline Linux as well. So these projects have had to work very hard to keep updating to the to later versions of the uh, mainline Linux. Um, and they've not been able to support every... every uh, kernel version, and so eventually with Weezy we had to drop these these patch sets. However, this this is all being implemented uh, in mainline Linux now, mostly by the same people who did OpenVZ, uh, and it's being done in a somewhat more flexible way. It's being done possibly in a more robust way because they're, they're talking to the uh, upstream maintainers. Um, but it's 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 slow. It's, it, the development has been fairly slow. I think it's nearly there now. Um, in Linux 3.7, uh, we can now have user namespaces, which allow uh, it's allowed you have a root user in a in, inside a container that is not the same thing as the root user for the physical for the for the the outer host, which is pretty important. Uh, it's no good having containers if if uh, the users in the containers can break out of them. Unfortunately, there are still some flaws with it, flaws with the implementation of user namespaces. There were some early security uh, problems with these where you, fact you could break out of a namespace. And also it requires all file systems which deal with user IDs to distinguish between the um, user IDs in the current container, or the current processor's container, and the, uh, the user ID in the outer machine. In fact, every user ID that's used inside a container must have a number in the outer machine, but it'll be a different number. Um, and so XFS still hasn't been changed to understand this, and uh, that seems like that's quite a big job. So if you... <laughs> If you've got nothing better to do with your time, you have a lot of spare time, then uh, you could uh, work with the upstream XFS developers to, to make that work. And then we might be able to enable user namespaces and have container support in the next, uh, the next Debian release again. So Bcache has just recently been added in Linux 3.10. It's in a way, it's a bit. It, it has some similarities with transcendent memory, but it's also very different. Uh, it allows you to use a, a fast disk, like a solid-state disk, as a cache in front of a larger disk that's not quite as fast. And it turns out this is such a good idea that it's been done several times over. There's also DM cache, uh, which was uh, in in uh, in mainline Linux and in Hearts IO, which is not. Um, but all three of these are available in Debian now. Bcache needs new user learn tools. Um, and in fact, someone has been working on a package of those. There's a, there's a bug number. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the status of this is, but it might be that it just needs a sponsor. So if you're interest, if this sounds like something interesting to you, look at the bugs, see if you can sponsor that package.
So, um, for PC, uh, for kernels that run on PCs, we're fairly used to having a single image that runs on uh, pretty much all PCs. There are some differences where I mean, we don't may remember we, on the i386 flavor we have on the i386 architecture we have multiple kernel flavors for older and newer processors. But aside from the processor uh, generation, you don't need a different uh, kernel for a, a Dell machine or an HP machine. And, and unfortunately, this hasn't been the case with ARM for a long time. Um, ARM, ARM, the company, uh, makes these designs for just the processor, and they don't standardize things like interrupt controllers, memory layouts. Uh, there isn't even standard uh, firmware like on a PC you have a BIOS or now UEFI. Um, historically hasn't had that at all, although that may be changing in the near future. So every ARM kernel image has been have had to be tailored to specific chips or even specific uh, even specific boards, um, which makes it quite difficult to support uh, a wide range of hardware in in Debian. We have to we have to have a different flavor for each one, and because we build all kernels, uh, we build well we build all our packages natively. Um, so we build all our ARM kernels on ARM, which isn't isn't a particularly fast. Uh, chips even today they're not they're not really as fast as xx6 processors so we end up with a large number of different kernel flavors and a very long build time it's, it's uh, about two days to, to build all the army l kernels currently um, and there's no no with that number of flavors there's no prospect of being able to add interesting things like doing a real-time arm kernel or uh, or a container supporting ARM kernel, and so on. Anyway, the good news is this, this is changing. Um, there's been a lot of work to describe uh, to uh, describe how uh, different ARM machines differ using something called a flattened device tree, which says uh, that is a, a standardized description of all the different. Uh, all those differences between machines, which uh, the kernel will parse at boot time, and then it'll start running the right bits of code for whichever machine, uh, whichever machine it's running on. So only the device, only the device tree, uh, needs to be needs to differ between machines. That's the idea, in a way. So currently, in the ARM HF port, we have an ARM MP kernel, which is supporting Calzada, Freescale, and Marvell chips, and there are more uh, likely to be coming along soon. The TIO map chips are sort of supported, although apparently not all of the drivers are working correctly in a multi-platform build, but that's uh, in one or two releases that should be, that should be good. Um, you may also remember a certain person going on and on about uh, the importance of the all-winner chips found in uh, ARM-based tablets that's uh, also partly supported. You can use <laughs> you can uh, you can use a serial port and the the uh, Ethernet port. Uh, as yet there's no uh, there's no uh, storage drivers which is a bit of a problem but there's a <laughs> there, there, there is work upstream to, to get these drivers uh, included and support us in a multi-platform kernel. So that's the kernel sorted, right? But we still need an installer that will that will that knows how to install all the bits on these uh, all these various machines. Um, and unfortunately, that does still is going to still going to need specific support for specific machines. Um, similarly with boot the bootloader, well, um, generally they'll have a, a bootloader installed. It might be necessary, to, which is U-Boat, but they might need a second, uh, uh, a second stage of bootloader, or they might need, uh, they might need some configuration. And at the moment, this isn't easy to do. It's possible to do, um, but you really need to be 
uh, a real enthusiast read up uh, on uh, all the details. So if you want to make this work, or if you want to make uh, Debian work on new ARM systems, talk to the ARM porters, talk to the uh, Debian installer team on the Debian boot list. Uh, oh, and there's another problem, which is the, the um, most of our uh, most of the GPUs on PCs are now supported by free drivers. Uh, Intel and AMD actually provide documentation. Nvidia doesn't, but has their chips have been quite successfully reverse engineered and supported by the Nouveau driver. Unfortunately, the same isn't true on ARM yet. Um, that being said, there are there are I think three or four reverse engineering projects to uh, for the different GPUs that are out there, uh, which have have some success. They're not really ready for production yet, but uh, if you want to make Debian on ARM, you know a um, a, a, a usable free desktop environment, um, then you could. Have a look at and uh, join those reverse engineering projects. So that's that's about it. There are an awful lot more features that uh, that uh, have been introduced, but most of those are drivers and f file system features, which pretty much just work. You don't do anything particularly clever, um, or they're already handled by the uh, uh, the uh, the user land package, which is already in Debian. So, uh, any questions about any of those or other features that you're interested in? Thank you. Uh, so we, we have 15 minutes for questions. So, if anyone has a question, please ask. Hi. Uh, as a non-kernel guy, sometimes I need to try to build my own kernel in a Debian package. Is, is there, are there any plans to make that easier for people who don't do that all day? So you, you build a custom kernel package. That is pretty easy already, isn't it? You just make that package. I mean, if you download the source and then or are you talking about building a custom package from the Linux source package? No, from, from the from Debian sources. Source. Sorry? From the Debian sources. Sometimes it gives a very mysterious error message and you don't really know what to do. You're, you're talking about, you, you start with apt-get source Linux, is that what? Yeah. Yeah, okay, well it's, if you want to build a custom kernel, it's much easier to, to do apt-get install Linux source. Uh, and then and then you use the uh, make dip package command to build your to build your kernel. Uh, actually, editing the uh, the uh, Debian source package of Linux is uh, <laughs> it's it's pretty complicated. It's I, I understand that, uh, and that's I don't recommend that you do that. So the kernel handbook is the Debian kernel handbook package, and the kernel handbook sorry, kernel-handbook.alioth.debian.org explain uh, the sort of recommended ways to, to build a custom kernel. Are there any other questions? And you mentioned that there are uh, various tools need to enable the new features. Uh, can you also say something about the tools needed to enable the user namespace features and other namespace features? Are they available upstream and uh, what about the Debian status? Um, well, I would assume, I haven't actually looked at this uh, for a while, but there's a, there's a package called LXC, which, uh, is, which stands for Linux something containers, uh, and I would assume that that is going to make use of user namespaces, but I don't know whether it's up to date and ready to use them yet. Obviously, because we haven't enabled them in the kernel, then uh, due to the conflict with XFS, then that can't work quite yet. Any 
Any other question? Well, thanks, Ben, and thanks, everyone.